I think, especially here in the heart of Silicon Valley, where organizations pride themselves on their innovation and their creativity, if any place were to be able to take advantage of a diverse workforce and the creativity that's associated with that diversity, it should be here. And yet, time and time again, we see evidence that Silicon Valley firms are, in fact, very homogeneous, mostly male and mostly white. We don't have a lot of leaders who are female or people of color. But let's focus on a minute on females, because if we're ever going to be successful in diversity, that should be the dimension on which we are most successful, because we have the most of them, right? 51% of the population. So what happens? Well, turns out that we actually have a bias. If we think leader, too many of us think male. And if we think male, we think leader. But in fact, there's some very interesting research that's coming out uh, in the last couple of years that suggests that that perspective may be changing. One of the, my most favorite studies is a study that was done. Uh, it's actually a meta-analysis. So they got a whole bunch of other studies, 99 different studies. And they looked at leaders who evaluated themselves and whose subordinates evaluated them. And they came up with a very interesting set of results. What they found was that while male leaders evaluated themselves as more effective than did their female counterparts, the subordinates of these leaders evaluated the female leaders as more effective than they did their male counterparts. And this was true except in two industries, government and the military. Now, what's unique about those two industries? Those two industries are extremely hierarchical. So women were perceived by their subordinates as better leaders in organizations or in industries where it was a more collaborative form of leadership. Other researchers have found that one of the ways to actually get a more effective group is to increase the number of women. And it turns out there's actually a very high correlation between the number of women in a group and the ability of that group to be innovative and creative. The first contender may be that there simply aren't enough qualified women. A second contender may be non-conscious or implicit bias. A third contender may be that the criteria by which we hire changes depending on who we're looking at. And the fourth criteria may be that, in fact, what happens is we get women into the organization, we don't move them up because we change the criteria by which we judge their performance. This is an interesting perspective because it suggests that were there enough qualified women, of course we would hire them. But what's interesting to observe, given that statement, is that since 1988, more women have graduated from U.S. universities than have men. And in 2010, for example, the majority of people receiving undergraduate degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs were women. And so it turns out that a lot of people who are getting these advanced degrees happen to be female. So maybe it's not that there are not enough qualified women. Maybe what's happening is we're not seeing these women as qualified. Now, maybe that's because of implicit bias. Right? We have biases about what we think would be the correct person to have in this job. And so my favorite example of how powerful this implicit bias is, is some work by Golden and Rouse. And what they did was they went to symphony orchestras who were conducting auditions. And they said, we'd like you to conduct your auditions behind a curtain. Now, this didn't seem a big deal because think about a symphony orchestra. What does a symphony orchestra care about? The quality of the music. Who cares if the violin that is so awesome is being played by a male or a female? This is irrelevant. And in fact, certainly, their financial 
um, model does not require that they have all males or all females. It's irrelevant. It's the quality of the music that the patrons will pay for. And so what happened? So they did uh, their auditions behind a curtain, which hid the race and gender of the musician. And when they did that, women were 50% more likely to move up in the audition process and 250% more likely to gain a seat in the orchestra. So while there seems to be no economic incentive as to why we have this bias, it may be that there is a psychological impediment that stops us from seeing, from hearing the music of women as being equal or sometimes better than the music of men. Wouldn't that be awesome if we could actually just judge people on their performance rather than filtering that performance through their notion of gender? and what is appropriate or not appropriate. Well, actually, an organization here in the Valley did that. What they did is they had an online application process, and the application process required that people engage in activities that were uh, representative of what they would be doing in the organization. And before they judged who they would actually bring in for the interview, they stripped all of the information about race or gender from the applicants. They just had their performance. And when the curtain was pulled back, over 60% of the top performers were people of color or women. There's an organization here called Speak with a Geek, which is a tech recruiting organization. And they did an interesting experiment. They sent out resumes to their clients 5,000 resumes, and the clients reviewed those resumes and then sent back requests to interview folks. And when they did this with full information about the race and gender uh, of the applicants, fewer than 5% of the women were called back for interviews. They took those same 5,000 resumes and sent them out again, but they stripped off identifying information about race and gender. And in that case, 54% of the resumes that were asked to be brought in for interviews were resumes of women. The difference is huge. Oftentimes, we look at the candidate and decide what it is we want and adjust the criteria to who we are looking at. There was a wonderful study that was done uh, by researchers who posed to, to uh, people who were doing recruiting for a traditional male job, a police chief. And in advance of their looking at candidates, they ask the recruiters, what do you care more about? And it turns out there were two dimensions that really came through. One was experience and one was education. And so, in fact, these recruiters privileged education over experience. So, they sent out two Vitas. The Vitas were exactly the same, except that Vita number one, from Bob, had more education than experience. And from Barbara, she had more experience than education. And true to what they said, they selected Bob over Barbara. Then what the researchers did is they switched the names. So now Barbara has more education and Bob has more experience. And guess what the recruiters preferred now? You guessed it, experience. The solution here, of course, is to establish clear criteria before you begin the interview process. But that's just half the job. You've got to make sure that you actually have the correct criteria. So consider, for example, the challenge that Carnegie Mellon University had when they attempted to improve the gender balance of their computer science major. They were having a very small percentage of women being, applying for and being admitted to their computer science program. Now, as they reassessed the criteria by which they judged 
whether you could be admitted or not, one of the criteria was a lot of experience in computers, which at first blush seems quite reasonable. Computer major, you should understand computers. But let's take that apart just a little bit. So if I were majoring in medicine, well, how much experience would I have to have in a medical setting before I could be a medical major? Or how much engineering experience do I need before I became an engineer? Or how much teaching experience would I need before I became an educator? You see, what happens is, is that we actually help people figure out how to be a doctor, an engineer, a teacher. That's what graduate and undergraduate education is all about. So the percentage of women went from 7% to 42% with just that one change. Research was done uh, looking at organizations. In fact, they were, there were three tech organizations and one consulting firm. And, they, and the researchers got access to all of the performance reviews from those four companies. And they did an analysis of how did those, did those reviews differ by gender, and if so, how. What they found was is that the majority of, re, of the reviews of males, as compared to females, actually associated the review with a tangible business-related outcome. So the men were told how well or poorly they did on something that mattered to the organization, a real business outcome. What was interesting is, for the females, they were mostly given vague feedback. You're doing OK, you're not doing well, maybe you need to have this. But they did, there was no precision in that feedback. And of the women who were given more precise feedback, what was also true was it was mostly about their communication style. And this is the factoid that I think is most telling. In looking at all of these performance reviews, 75% of the individuals in these reviews who were judged to be aggressive, and that aggression came out in their performance review, were women. Seriously? Of all the people in these organizations, the problem they were having with aggression was because of the females? Or maybe it's because we have a different standard for what we, we adjudicate as aggression in women versus aggression in men. There was a study uh, in a medical school that looked at the letters of recommendation um, for their students who were going out into residency positions. And they found very interesting results. Number one, the letters of the male students were much longer than those of the female. And the letters of the male students talked about their accomplishments and their potential, while the letters of the female students talked about their personality. Think about an organization whose culture is strongly committed to meritocracy and data-driven decisions. You'd think in that type of organization, a lot of these problems would go away. But it turns out just the opposite is true. When an organization has such a strong adherence to meritocracy and data-driven decisions, and their managers and leaders, because of their association with the organization, or by explicit statement, agree with that, it turns out those folks are actually more likely to discriminate against women and people of color in their compensation decisions. Why? It may sound paradoxical, but it turns out that this is called the moral licensing effect. So have you ever been in a situation, well, it happens to me all the time, I go work out, and then because I've worked out really hard, I now give myself permission to have that piece of chocolate cake. That's called moral licensing. I've already proved that I'm a good person, I worked out, and now whew, I can eat my cake. If I'm a manager in an organization that has such a strong notion of meritocracy, then by definition of being in that organization, I lower my guard 
about whether or not my individual decisions are consistent with that because this is part of this organization. It's our DNA. So of course we focus on merit and data. This is the problem. Organizations and individuals need to be eternally vigilant. We cannot just assume that that problem has passed, that we have solved the problem because we care about data or that we care about meritocracy. We have to assess, are the decisions that I'm making consistent with the data? Not my perceptions, not my biases, but the data. And more importantly, do I every day make sure that I actually broaden the potential of who might, I might consider for jobs rather than narrow? Am I taking responsibility? When I see good performance, do I let other people know? Or do I just let that good performance speak for itself? Assuming, of course, everyone else will see it. So what is my contribution to the lack of diversity in my organization? And that's something that every one of us needs to think about because it is up to us to change. Thank you.